Hey, everybody. Before the show gets started, full disclosure, we recorded this episode August 3rd. It's about three months ago. So we held on to it for a little while because both Sean Umstead and Michelle Vanderwalker, the subjects of today's episode, will be opening up Kingfisher in Durham, this fantastic bar that we get to towards the end of the episode. Uh, we wanted to time it a little closer to the time that bar was going to open. It does seem like it may not open for another couple months, but the things they talked about were really fascinating, and we really get into the mindset of a business owner creating a culture. Now, both Michelle and Sean went to Tales of the Cocktail, which was held in July, and we asked them to take copious notes because we wanted to ask them all about what was happening there in New Orleans. Uh, so we get into that in the beginning. And then we talk about Kingfisher, but I also want to let you know that Sean has an event coming up December 11th. You're going to hear this little spot in the middle of the podcast. It's the All-Star Chef Series with Social House, with the Carolina Hurricanes hockey team, and Chefs Katie Button and Mirwan Irani out there in Asheville will be cooking, and Sean Umstead will be making cocktails. So December 11th, you can get your tickets. Go to NHL.com backslash Hurricanes backslash Tickets All-Star Chef Series, or just click the notes on our show notes, and uh, that'll be the easiest way. And now, the show. You're listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast, coming to you from the kitchen studios located high atop the historic Raleigh Building, located in the heart of downtown Raleigh. The NCF&B Podcast takes you behind the scenes of North Carolina's food and beverage industry. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at NCFBPod. This episode is sponsored in part by Food Scene. That's food, S-E-E-N, dot com. Providing professional photography, social media management, video production, and website design. That's Food Scene. And now, the sommeliers to the stars, the barbacks in your backyard. It is Max and Max. Well, hello, and thank you for listening to the NCF&D Podcast. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss. And today, back in studio, we have the new King Fishers of Durham, Mr. Sean <laughs> Umstead and his lovely wife, Michelle Vanderwalker. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, hello. Thanks for having us. So you guys just got back last week from Tales of the Cocktail, the world-famous cocktail conference that takes place in New Orleans every year. And... Um, we want to know about it. Sean, you did some social media for us uh, for the NCF&B podcast, and uh, we'll get into more about it later where you guys are opening up a new bar in Durham and a whole bunch of other stuff. But bring us into what Tales of the Cocktail is and what it's like to be there. Uh, sure. Um, so Tales of the Cocktail is a uh, cocktail conference. Um, that's that's, that's what, how they describe it. Um, it's 11 years old. It came out of a uh, essentially what was a, a food tour and, and just grew out of this kind of cocktail tour of New Orleans into this behemoth of a, of a conference um, that happened to it happened to coincide with very nascent uh, cocktail movement and then became this sort of congregating place for bartenders in the summer um, to get together, grow and learn and and, uh, and um, it's it's really become a, a very a very large enterprise. Yeah, and it's international, right? Like people from other many other countries, many European countries are coming. As yeah, well. we went to um, we went to a conference by a gentleman from Singapore, from London. We went to a pop up bar from bartenders in Australia. I went to a seminar all about Africa cocktails. That's right, cocktail scene in Africa. Wow. Yeah. What's something that you took from there? Um, well, they mostly talked about the scene there and how Africa is becoming more of a destination place. Um, a lot of the cities are pretty international now, um, growing up, and they've got a lot of really poppin' cocktail bars now. It's becoming a scene, and people from Africa are sometimes either going to Europe for school or growing up in Europe and then coming back to Africa yeah. and coming back with the idea that they want to bring some of the... Um, some of the things that they've had in European cities and bring them back mm. to various countries. There was a South African and someone from Nigeria there. So really all different parts of Africa. I mean, now now you're our official African consulate. <laughs> uh, everything about this, but are there uh, are you aware of like African liquors that are being produced? They did not really talk about any African liquor brands. Um, there's still a lot of local stuff being produced there. 
but they did talk a lot about using local herbs and produce and things like that yeah to make their fancy cocktails so that's pretty cool yeah people are mm. getting drunk all over the world yeah that's right i want to know though what were some key takeaways from the education like give me something that really spoke to you being that you're about to open up your own bar in general what really are you bringing back home um, I went to a seminar on diversity in the industry, and um, that one was really great for me. It was a great panel, um, four different people from all walks of life, and um, they had some really good tips about starting with putting out job postings, about how to make sure that you're inclusive mm. of everyone to get employees that are diverse so that the diverse group that, you know, the diverse um, population of Durham will feel comfortable coming in Mm -hmm. if your employees aren't all a bunch of 30-something white people. (laughs) And so what are those tips? Um, Michelle and I are 30-something white people, so we're we're already starting behind the eight ball a little bit. (laughs) No one likes you. Yeah. Um, Well, some of the tips are just when you're writing a job posting, only include must-have qualifications that are actually must-haves. And their point there was that – Women will only apply for a job if they meet all of the must-have qualifications, whereas men meet 60% and they're like, oh, good enough, I'll apply. Oh, that <laughs> totally makes sense. And right. I've heard that before. That, yeah. yeah it's, but, I mean, come on. that <clears throat> That's on women, right? <laughs> I mean, not to be I totally mean... sexist, but like, <laughs> if you say these are things you need to have – and you look at it and you don't have, like, the confidence to think that I can do this or whatever. I mean, isn't that – that's on you. Yeah, that's your than, own it's your own Mishigas, so, as we would say in Yiddish. Right. Like, may, that's um, – maybe I'm just being a total bro right now, but if, if it says this and these are the rules, then it it also is on a bunch of dudes for breaking the rules and saying, yeah, man, I can do that. Sure, whatever. Fake it till you make it. But – well, I think it's also on the people putting out the job posting. If they're going to go ahead and take some of those guys who apply and, and some of those guys who apply with only 60% of the qualifi- qualifications get the job anyway. Right. But just, if that's all the applicants you're getting, But if, I guess. if that's all the applicants, you know, you're going to have a smaller than, applicant pool. So right. if you really and, only need some of those things, just put the things you actually well, need. Well, as a previous employer, I would put things like must have two years kitchen experience. Like I don't want to start – I don't want to – Start from scratch with somebody that has no idea how to hold a knife. So it's like, I just want to know that you kind of get it. I need yeah, to even tomorrow. That, but like, even that, two years is not a must-have. They might have they might have even been in six months, but they worked in a really good kitchen and they're a quick right. learner. And, and so what we're saying is that there's probably a guy in this scenario that has six months but knows that he knows what I need. Yeah. And he just goes, yeah, I could, I'll just apply anyways. Right. Whereas maybe a, a woman that had only six months and has the same experience and qualifications and could do it. Looks at it and says, "Well, it, it does they want two, two years, years, and I only have six months." So yeah, I mean, I, I think it. it's our whole culture that teaches women to really like follow the rules and only do things that you're qualified for. Whereas men are taught, "Well, you can do it, just do it." Hmm. And I mean, I have gone against that multiple times. Sean and I met at the 21C, where I walked in. <laughs> Michelle is not the listen to all the qualifications. I mean, I person. went in and starting in banquets. Uh, quickly moved down to the restaurant as a food runner and then just talked my way into bartending with zero experience. I just said, yeah. I can do this, put me back there. Yeah. But that's rare, I think, for a woman to have that um, that amount of confidence. I mean, there's and studies. It took, yeah. yeah and it, there's studies that show that because I, I, would, mm-hmm. I, I can just imagine there's a lot of women right now, like you, like my wife, like your wife, saying, I wouldn't, I don't give a shit if I can. Yeah, well, saying yeah, like I would do it. I think uh, so, sometimes you can look at it and just say, uh, job postings have been written forever by men, and they write, you know, for their their audience. They don't they they write, you know, in their in their voice and in their language, and it's usually one that speaks to other men that they've, you know, had they, you know, sure. been, been in that, that environment. On a so, scale, yeah. so I think is there an implied we're trying to not hire diverse people with the way I'm writing this job posting? Is that I, do, I, I think, feel like there's an well, inference that that's so, what the person's getting at that's teaching this I think class. Michelle maybe would talk about this too in, in, in her diversity, and maybe they talked about this as well. I think in general when you write things, it is, it is much easier to accidentally be exclusive, whether mm-hmm. it's a job posting or a menu or an advertisement. Um, just the way you phrase things, you know, if you – you know how how much minutia you put on a menu. You know, for example, something something I'm going to write on our job posting for our kitchen for our chef is, you know, a certain amount of years working in a from scratch kitchen, and that and that's important. But I won't put that for for a line cook. I won't put like a, a from scratch kitchen. I think I think somebody with the right work ethic 
um, could certainly transition from a kitchen that gets most of their stuff pre-prepared, um, but but does a good job and works hard into into our kitchen. So I just think it, it it's just something to be aware of. And I think when we you know when we start to talk about Kingfisher more and more, Michelle and I mostly talk about trying to be aware of yeah. different of different people and different cultures, what what our town is and and who we would you know ideally like to see in yeah. the bar, which is. Which is everybody. If you even think about in your own home and people who are in relationships, how things you say and tone and stuff and intonation and, and, and things you write, even though you're meaning one thing, somebody jokes. takes as a completely jokes, political mm-hmm. incorrectness, political, especially in this day and age of politi- uber political correctness. It's crazy. But I do want to move on from there. Sure. And I do want to know if there's any other, and maybe there isn't, but if there was any other major takeaway in that, like, right, because I'm interested in writing that job description for to, to be inclusive or to be inclusive. Yeah. Um, so the other thing they talked about was just um, providing uh, development um, for employees and providing space mm. for them to grow. Um, they said that's one of the biggest um, ways you can influence your retention rate is by providing employees opportunities to move up within your company right. and to learn various things. So, you know, one of the things that we'd like to do is provide that opportunity. We'll have books around will you know hopefully um you know train people we we yeah. we're getting people in with the idea that they want to move up so that'll be one of our things on our job posting and also in our interview you know are you interested in just being a bar back forever or do, like are you interested in yeah. learning becoming a bartender maybe even moving a manager out, one day yeah maybe yeah. even manager like one day list and then eventually you know something like in a creative sense yeah right exactly so you know we don't want to hire people who just want to do their job and go home we want to yeah. hire people who are interested in well i imagine that you both would have so much pride that say 10 years from now there are five new bars that have opened up that all came through kingfisher yeah and that's where they that would be great they you know cut their teeth so to speak yeah on how to I do would it love so, that. Mm-hmm. the bill yeah. wall street yeah and if yeah. we have bartenders yeah. ourselves who started as barbacks in in our space and moved up and now are really knowledgeable and you know we've sent them to tails or something that's cool so well what about yourself sean uh one of the breakouts what's something a takeaway that you had from from sure um so i also went to a a more um bar culture kind of seminar um i went to a, a seminar about being a leader in the bar industry and what that looks like um it was it was really well done i thought the speakers were excellent one of the women uh opens cocktail bars in, in secondary and tertiary markets. She was very interesting. And they also had a uh, organizational psychologist, I believe is what it's called, um, and he talked a lot mm-hmm. about leadership styles. So a lot of the takeaways I had from it was that there's not a right way to be a leader and that your leadership style, whatever it is, also has pitfalls that you need to be aware of. So, for example, she spoke a lot about how she was a leader by example. She would go in, she would work the hardest, she'd be there the latest. If things weren't cleaned right, she would clean it again. Just just be the clear example, which seems like, like a no-lose proposition, right? That's like that's like the athlete mentality. Like you show up, Kobe Bryant stays in the gym later than everybody who who's not Kobe Bryant, and he's you know, that's Ugh, that's how you motivate terrible people, right? Example. <laughs> <Yeah>. Or LeBron. <laughs> no, no, no. You keep going, Kobe. Yeah, yeah. he was Great. my favorite basketball player. So. Me too. Yeah. 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 How are you a Mets fan and also a Kobe Bryant fan? Well, Those I was, are not common. I was a Kobe Bryant fan before I moved to New York. So. That's your NBA production background there. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to be a Knicks when fan, you, but the Knicks are more depressing than the Mets. Tough. Yeah, that's yeah. really tough. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, so they were speaking. She was speaking about her style, which seemed so perfect and so obvious. And like the thing that you know, I, I'm that's not exactly my leadership style, but I take I want to take a lot from that. Yeah, and I'm the, a more do as I say, not as I do well, lead, the, type of leader. So the psychologist, <laughs> the psychologist suggested that to be a leader all the time, that is a very stressful way to do it because the everyone that's following you is going to remember the one bad day you have where you don't do that mm. and that's what they're going to lean on. So if you're going to do that, you have to be unbelievably consistent. Um, so, you know, it was really interesting to hear all these different diverse leadership styles and kind of meld them into one. And, and you know, I think they also talked a lot about what it means to be a leader um, in the industry, you know, whether that's on... Uh, being like a very avant-garde cocktail maker it, for uh, whether it means how you how you deal with your environmental responsibility, how you deal with responsibility of employing people. Um, anyway, I thought those were all really great. And I also went to a seminar all about bittering agents, just just to make sure there's some you know cocktail uh, that's stuff. Cool. That, so we tasted like 
15 different actual bitters like gentian, uh, angelica, like all kinds of different bittering agents that are in vermouths and, and, and amaros. Um, that was done by Camper English, who's like the foremost uh, expert of, of bitters and, and cocktail ingredients, probably in the country. He's from San Francisco. So there there are like amazing resources there. I also went to just a straight up social media um, conference on like how, yeah. how you do it. Um, so that, that panel was amazing. Um, it was Jim Meehan from PDT. Pam Wisnitzer, uh, who was the USBG president, is also like a, a very big personality on Instagram. Um, licensed to Distill, who I believe he said in two years went from zero to one million followers. Holy cow! Yeah, and and it was really interesting. Um, there was there was a battle of wills a little bit from Jim, uh, who's the who's sort of a standoffish like he didn't have social media until he wrote a book, and his publisher was basically like, if you don't do this, you're a fool, yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. And then Pam, who's like naturally very social media driven. There was also uh, a guy from Death and Company that was that was terrific. Uh, he had another perspective of just being like he has a very specific design for his brand. So those three seminars to me really encompass what I want to learn about, which is you know how to effectively market a bar because it is a business. How to be responsible to the people that work for you and the community you're in, and you know how to make damn good drinks. <laughs> I, I am. This is gonna might go down a rabbit hole with this question uh, in terms of leadership, and I'm gonna pose that question to you in a second. But first, I know that we have to get a word in from uh, another leader in the industry in North Carolina from Social House Vodka. And now, please welcome to the ice your Carolina chefs. Social House Vodka, the handcrafted and gluten-free vodka from North Carolina, has partnered with the Carolina Hurricanes to present the inaugural All-Star Celebrity Chef Series. Throughout the 2018-2019 hockey season, culinary enthusiasts will be able to enjoy six special dinners prepared by some of North Carolina's best chefs. Tickets to the event will include a four-course dinner, cocktail provided by one of the state's best mixologists, and seats for that evening Carolina Hurricanes game. The exciting lineup of chefs includes culinary talent from Wellington to Asheville and everywhere in between. The chefs participating are scheduled to begin on November 10th with Dean Neff of Pinpoint Restaurant in Wilmington. Fun things happen when you collaborate on things like this. And Chris Coleman of Stoke Charlotte. Yeah, uh, cooking uh, with vodka in dishes is something maybe new. Cooking with vodka in glasses nearby, you know, that, that <laughs> happens quite frequently. Right now we're seeing these really beautiful stone crab claws, and so mm. uh, I'm definitely going to be bringing things from the coast over there. That's what most people want me to bring when I head inland. We have a, a Korean-style fried chicken, so it's double dredged in a tempura batter and fried, and, and that tempura batter leans heavily on, on vodka. Because it, uh, the higher the alcohol, it makes you know bubbles kind of pop up rapidly in the batter in the fryer. So you get this really light, crispy, delicious crust on this fried chicken. So I could see us doing something like that, maybe with vodka. The Celebrity Chef Series promises to bring an international flavor down home to North Carolina. Tickets for the Carolina Hurricanes All-Star Celebrity Chef Series and Hockey Games are $125. For details, check our show notes. And to get up-to-date schedules, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. And we'll be right back with the show, but first a quick word about our new sponsor, Laura Harris. She is the restaurant industry preferred agent. She's been in the business in the restaurant industry for about 17 years, so she gets it. We all work long hours, we work weekends, we work holidays. The demand on our work schedule is crazy, so if we have to, in our own personal lives, do something that is super challenging, like find a new home, she is there to save you time, money, and hassle. You can reach her at 919-896-2697 or go to ncfbhomes.com. That's ncfbhomes.com. And when she helps you close on a house, she even has a thousand dollar kickback to anyone that's in the restaurant industry. A thousand bucks. Hey, we know that you might be buying homes for hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it would be nice to get a little extra change for your pocket, fill your refrigerator full of some good liquor and some beer and some wine, and uh, and then invite us over, you know, because we told you about Laura Harris. So again, you can reach her at 919-896-2697 or at ncfbhomes.com. Powered by Fathom Realty. 
I know this is sports related, but obviously we have a scandal going on with Ohio State and Urban Meyer going on administrative leave. And so I'm wondering, you guys as becoming leaders and as we start to transition into talking about Kingfisher and we're talking about hiring for a bar and being leaders, uh, what would you do if you knew that one of your employees who you liked as a person and was working well in the system uh, was having a domestic violence abuse problem at home? Like they've been arrested, like they that, like there was. Well, so technically the guy has been this? arrested. Well, he, yeah. Okay. He actually, he's never been convicted or arrested. So he's trying to par- math parallel yeah. this to Urban Meyer because there are allegations, but he hasn't been accused officially. It's just allegations at this yeah. point. And and from my mind, Urban Meyer knew. There's no question that he knew. <laughs> but this is, I've yeah, always this wanted is, to be on a sports show. Really, yeah. To be honest. No, no, no. But as as a leader, though. Let's say, let's just make a scenario. You knew that one of your bartenders was uh, was was his do- wife. Domest- yeah, domestically abusing his wife. Yeah, I'd fire him. No um, question. Yeah, I'd, uh, Michelle can chime in too, but I would I would certainly let him go. Um, it's not it's not from. I mean, it does come from like a strong moral conviction, but you have a responsibility to the people that work with you. Um, you can't you can't set that as a precedent um, where where you approve of. Of that kind of thing, um, you know, someone who has an issue with domestic violence, um, you don't know who that's going to hit close to home with. That works with you, you don't know who else is dealing with that. Yeah. I think that's a much more pervasive problem than than we give it credit for uh, in the in you know in in our culture. Um, and and I don't I, I think you have to make you know clear stands. I, I know Michelle and I haven't talked a lot about what we would do in the situation specifically of domestic violence, but we certainly speak um and it lo- doesn't have to be domestic right. violence that just but it has we, to be something uh, of something that's uh that's yeah morally incorrect right so we we speak a lot about um you know me too is a is a big movement and and, and how um how women uh exist in the workplace i think is a is a is a big deal um for us and and, and i know for michelle and um people like Ashley Christensen have taken a, an excellent leadership role, and we learn a lot from her. Mm-hmm. Especially um, in a place where there's liquor flowing, and right. it's, you also, I mean, it's not an uncommon thought to have, like, one wants to have attractive people working at their place because attractive people attract business, and people stay there, but you couldn't officially say that out loud and be like, I'm going to hire beautiful people here, whether they're men or women. It's like, that's a, but at the same time, you want people to be pleasing to like they're not offensive to look at I, I don't know it's a weird it's a weird model that you put yourself in because you're a public business so how do well, you go about doing that and being socially correct from our hiring standpoint i think you know at a cocktail bar that's craft driven and product driven and i think you can you can hire the best people um i, I think most people are 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 pretty attractive I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. I mean, but, I sorry, think. sorry, wife. Um, but but I do think I do think at a place your skills speak for themselves, especially mm-hmm. in a in a cocktail bar like that. I don't um, I don't I don't think that'll be something that factors into our hiring. But um, from a from a perspective of dealing and creating a culture, um, and, and I'm gonna let, uh, pass pass the mic. Um, but I I think it's just really important to know your values um, and and for your employees to know. The, that you stand behind them in scenarios that they're going to be in, because in a bar where liquor is flowing, inevitably um, uncomfortable situations arise. So Michelle, yeah, can speak well, more we've to that. talked a bit about during our initial training, and then often as we operate, um, having conversations with our employees about the way that they treat each other and our expert expectations um, of ourselves and of them, and of the interactions between guests and our employees. Um, We plan to have a policy of if someone's making you uncomfortable in any way, feel free to come. Like, please come tell us. We will deal with it. You don't have to. If someone is making snide comments or asking you, you know, to go get them something else because they want to watch you walk away one more time Mm -hmm. and you just don't want to deal with it, we'll deal with it. You don't. You don't need to continue, you know, even if it's as simple as us taking over that guest table and just saying you don't get to have that um, server anymore Mm -hmm. because you're not. You know, and we don't mm. even have to say if it's something as simple as like they haven't said anything directly, but we feel uncomfortable. We'll take it over and deal with it. Yeah. Um, and to the point of if there's actual any sort of harassment going on between customer and guest, we will immediately ask that guest to leave. We're not afraid of turning people off 
um, yeah, you turning wanna... people away. We're, we don't want to have an environment well, where that's bad people are feeling threatened. Because, yeah, way. that person, whoever that person might be, is a cancer to your own business because they might be keeping other people from coming into your door. So by eliminating right. one, you actually might attract more. Yeah, exactly. Sure, because right. people want to come to a place where they yeah. feel comfortable. And the I... same with the culture in the in the kitchen and behind the bar. You know, we're... We're not going to tolerate employees um, yeah. saying um, saying I, harassing things to each other. I guess where I was going with that, and not to what you're saying is absolutely is fantastic, and I admire it. But I guess what I'm wondering, and maybe it's more in my own mind, but I guess I'm a co-host of the show, so I get to say what I want to say. Definitely. But um, but I, I'm just I'm I'm really um, confused by this issue on so many levels because it's not just about the culture within your workplace right like just as and by i just want to make this a hundred percent clear in no way am i advocating for domestic violence i think it's abhorrent i think it's morally incorrect and there's something seriously wrong with with somebody that needs to do that uh however having said that um are we of course we don't want to enable that person to who is uh abusing their spouse however we're not necessarily fixing the problem if we want to be if we want to be morally responsible for our brothers and sisters by firing that person. So I don't think it's a simple thing as to say that. And also, I pose the question, are we then involving ourselves in other people's private lives in their homes? And just with that scenario, if that person is a um, respectful employee adding to your guests and your revenue and everything is great within the workplace, but not great within the home place. So it's, 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 I, I, I'm, I'm merely saying that I don't think it's just as simple as saying, Oh, I'd fire that person because one, how do we get involved in somebody else's right. home life? And two, if we truly do want to help, maybe firing is not the answer, but to see the error of their ways and try to get them help in that scenario. Well, And I'm not saying what you're saying sure, is sure, wrong or sure. irresponsible. I'm just saying that the way it's being dealt with yeah. here and I think in, in, in all walks of life that people think it's a simple answer. Yeah. Um, well, I I do think um, in, in the scenario, if I have found out about it, yeah. then his – personal life is invading our work life. Like, mm, if true. I know about you're it, you're uncomfortable if, because you're around a person I, that you don't if yeah. I, if I know about, point. Right. And if I know about it, then my bartender, the cook, the yeah. dishwasher, people, other people are going to know about it. And, and that is, I mean, you guys can both speak to this. Restaurants are not uh, the most tight-lipped place. I yeah. mean, everybody, <laughs> you spend so much time together at such odd hours that you become very family-oriented. So Gossip and, flows as much as booze. Right. So I also think that you can you can tell you can make it clear that you can't work here anymore. You don't have to condemn the person to uh to you don't have to condemn the situation where you're washing your hands of it. You can say you can say I'm sorry. This is not something that we can stand for. Much like you could say what you want on your podcast. I think businesses have to you know look out for themselves as yeah. well. Um, so you you can let them go, but you don't have to abandon the situation. Um, I think. I think you are certainly um, – it's well within you know your ability, hopefully, to, to say, you know, we would love to seek out help for you. Um, and I think this comes down to, to all kinds of issues, um, whether it's – Yeah. Whether it's you have – Drug abuse. Dr- especially things like substance abuse, and drug yes. abuse. If, if a person has an issue um, – and and I have I have learned a, a lot from, um, from people uh, and spoken uh, – Two people like Scott Crawford, and and he would say, you just have to love on them and and tell them you're there for them, and uh, this is specifically to, to substance abuse, and try and be available and know that they have an outlet, um, and that that goes to people with you know mental health issues, um, uh, and and I think in the situation of domestic violence, you probably hope I mean if you're if if their home life we're assuming they're married. Um, if if they're married and you have a f- good family and atmosphere at your business, then you probably know that woman fairly well too. Um, right. Reaching out to her, making sure she's okay. I think her safety would be the number one priority, um, and their their relationship probably secondary. So making sure that she and um, and any you know children in that environment are safe. Um, and, and you know being just being a, a resource for her too, because uh, especially in the Ohio State situation. I'm sure, uh, you know, her network of of of, uh, of wives of the of the football coaches I think was 
didn't sound uh, like they were very supportive. It, it it certainly didn't seem like they fixed anything for her. Um, but I do think she spoke pretty highly of Urban Meyer's wife. I don't. I don't. Mm. I don't. I haven't. I've been kind of fairly busy. I haven't followed it super specifically. But you know, she needs to know that there are people there that are willing to help and you know, willing to open themselves up. Well, I think we're talking about responsibility and how far the responsibility goes. Like employment. Like, yeah. Are there employers? Are employers responsible for this situation? And I do want to. You mentioned Scott Crawford, and this is something that people in this local area should understand if they don't already know. But uh, Scott Crawford actually uh, has opened his own chapter of Ben's Friends. This is a this is a support group for chefs, bartenders, servers, and others who others who struggle while trying to stay healthy, working long hours in stressful situations uh, with easy access to alcohol. I'm not that articulate. I was reading that. <laughs> Jessica Banoff wrote that in the News and Observer. But uh, Ben's Ben's Friends was started in Charleston, South Carolina, by Mickey Basque, Ed, who is a general manager of a restaurant, and they meet to help people with this exact same thing, you know, problems. And it, and it speaks to then having an, a, a business that is now going the next step and actually trying to help that situation. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not cool if someone's going to be abusing their wife. It's not cool if they're going to smack their kids around or, or, or drugs and alcohol. But, yes, but just saying goodbye to them and eliminating them from your lives, that's a simple answer. That's a, easy for you just to get them away from you. But it's not helping society. So I think with things like this, with nurturing and, and understanding and understanding, I think that's the point Matt was trying to get at, too, is that maybe businesses could also say, hey, man. Whereas I don't really want you working here because you don't make this environment safe or comfortable for the ones around you, I acknowledge that you have something that needs to be fixed. Yeah. So how can we get you to a place where you feel uh, comfortable not doing things that that afflict others? That is a deep rabbit hole to go down yeah. to mm-hmm. figure out. But it's something in the leadership conference, and as you guys are opening up your own place, I thought it was apropos because it's, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's something that probably yeah. you guys have thought about. I think one thing that we can do also is um, – try to make resources available to people before we see issues at all. Um, because a lot of people, you know, the, the real problem is going to be the employees that we don't know are going home right. and using drugs or committing domestic violence or, um, you know, any number Robbery, of other things. Like you just is, don't yeah. know. Um, so just making ourselves available to talk to people and to share resources with them, um, to encourage healthy lifestyles, all that can help prevent issues or address them before they become an issue for us in our space. Well said. What what excites me about your new place that's opening up is that all this talk we've been having right now, the biggest takeaways that you're speaking of are the things that are the most important to create a culture to start a new business. And that business, my transition, is Kingfisher uh, opening in Durham. Well and done. we want to know what that is. So please let us know and let us know how you got there. Sure. M- Michelle, you want to take that? What is Kingfisher? I think you should start with that one. I'll, okay. I'll talk about the second part. Okay, great. Kingfisher is sort of the, the culmination of, of a project I've been working on. So since I moved back to North Carolina, I grew up here, um, went to Chapel Hill, and then moved to New York City right after school. To work in NBA production. I was a, yeah, I was an NBA video. I wish we were doing more production at the facility when we were there. But it's John um, Tesh, man. Is that the NBA on NBC, the old one? Yeah, that was, I think so. That's John Tesh. Yeah, that, I, that song. Yeah. NBA hasn't been on NBC for like 15 years. But it was but still, it's cool. still better than, <laughs> song, than the awesome. ABC ESPN song. Yeah. yeah. Nothing better than that tune. So th- that was great. Um, and, uh, <laughs> And I got back into restaurants while I was there, and I came back with the intent of opening a bar. And that bar has gone through a lot of iterations. I think right when I moved back, it was definitely in like the classic cocktail kind of um, speakeasy kind of kind of place. Um, and as I've grown, it's 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 sort of taken on a life of my own, and I ha- I'm pretty confident in the the style of drinks I like to make, and they are unique to me, and and, uh, and what my what my palate's like. Then I met Michelle, and we we uh, it's evolved from there into this bar, which is a farm driven, place driven cocktail bar. Our goal is to take kind of the bounty of of North Carolina and turn them into the the central focus of our cocktails. So while we will make you hopefully one of the best Manhattan's you've ever had, what we really want to do is show you what strawberries from May of 2018 tasted like. In, you could, by the drink. way, just call your Manhattan a Raleighan. A Raleighan? Yeah. Oh, I'm in Durham. 
Oh yeah, <laughs> but I meant like <laughs> big Dura. cities, capital cities. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. The, yeah, not not Manhattan like is like, not the capital. Of <laughs> I understand New York. that, but but it's basically the capital of the world. No, they do that, right? They have like Manhattan's, they have Bronx, they have a Brooklyn, they yeah, have all these. Yeah. So we may we may do that. Um, uh, <laughs> You're not going to do that. Don't do that. We might. We, you it's never a know. Idea. Durham might. No, the Durham Hotel I think had their signature cocktails like called the Durham. Um, which is really good and very Manhattan. Is it a take on the a Manhattan? Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I might be a little bit more Vucare esque, but I, I don't remember exactly. It's very good. Um, so, so our bar is focused on being produce centric. So, yeah. um, for- well, I want to take a second to highlight that, and I think no better example is the cocktail you created to win a competition and get an or place in a competition and go to Louisville in, which was the carrot and fennel Sazerac. Yeah, um, that was a good that was a good example of what, what we'd like to do. Um, so I, I was I, I won a regional uh, cocktail contest at Fox uh, earlier this summer, and then was in the finals in Louisville, where there were some excellent bartenders with really great presentation skills and costumes and they could sing, uh, and and I think I think I was trumped a little bit there. And their drinks were amazing. But yeah, so we I did a fresh carrot juice um, that I reduced down a little bit, um, just a touch of fresh ginger juice, and then fennel a fennel juice syrup that I did with maple. Combine that with Copper and King's brandy um, and a little Peychaud's bitters and a, a little absinthe to make this like really fresh kind of smooth sipper that's at once a little bit of an after drink after dinner drink and and. Uh, I guess another side is like it's a Raleigh raw drink. So it's were the <laughs> ingredients, the carrots and the ginger and the fennel, all locally sourced, or could they be locally sourced? Yeah, they certainly could be. Um, we have a friend George who at Little Farm and and Timber Timberlake mm-hmm. Timberlake that grows ginger and turmeric all the time. But uh, the carrots we actually grew. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Which was awesome. Oh, yeah. um, Can't get our, more local than in that. our front yard. Yeah, and then the fennel. I didn't. I wasn't sure. I haven't transported a lot of food around the country, so I just bought the fennel when I got to Louisville. So I was. I didn't want to lose it all on the way. Um, <laughs> well, so he was. He was keeping it local. Was, uh, that's true. Yeah, point, either yeah. one of the two locals. Right. So yeah. I, so so for us, and and I think that's a that's a good um, segue for us. What local means, and we've talked a lot about it. Local people, a local environment, and then highlighting local ingredients. I don't think necessarily means no lemon, no lime, no citrus, yeah. no no spices from other parts of the world. I think it's saying, and I think chefs do a really good job of this too, highlighting local ingredients while not forsaking like what you're making. Um, so we can, we want to present cocktails that are centered around produce that fits from North Carolina in cocktails. Um, and one, one of the big ways we're doing that is um, through preservatives. Mm-hmm. Um, we're buying in bulk at the moment from farms um, like Little Farm, it's Lil Farm, L I L, right? Lil Farm, yeah. yeah. Um, from Bluebird Meadows. We Where did we drive to for the peaches? Kalawi. Kalawi, yeah. That was, uh, yeah. Um, that that farm was outside of the Uwari National Forest. So that was like a two-hour drive that we drove down for a bunch of peaches. Um, so we're buying those. You know, we're dehydrating. We're we we make great powders out of them. We've preserved a ton. We probably did, uh, I don't know, twenty twenty quart jars worth. 25. 20, she did most of it. I, I'm still working. Um, so uh, we do that. Um, we're, we're pickling things. We're trying to take those things through and into the into the seasons where it's not so readily available. And then we also want to do cocktails centered around the things that are like um, sweet potatoes and peanuts and ginger and turmeric and things that um, – and root vegetables, beets, things that you can have all year. And that kind of sounds a little esoteric, but I actually think that most people understand – Food and those those things, especially food that's been grown in North Carolina for a long time, much better than they understand like different liquors. Mm. Um, so when you can combine those things and make the, the the produce the star, I think it makes for a much easier conversation um, with with uh, with your guest. Oh, also the space is going to be amazing. Michelle is designing it all. She's a, a ceramic artist, um, so she's doing a lot of the glassware. She's doing all the tiles uh, for the bar top. Um, she also is basically the artistic uh, vision behind the, the space, which I think is uh, which is a very unique space. The ceilings are very low. It's it's going to be a dark, intimate uh, kind of place. Um, so Michelle can probably speak a little more. Yeah, what's your what's design, like Michelle? Um, so we're really just trying to make this whole place a complete experience. Um, 
so we want you to come in there and really be transported and feel like you're in a different place. Um, so with my design, I really have to limit myself sometimes because I see different things need to be done. I'm like, oh, I can do that. Oh, I can do that. And she now really can't do them my, all. My, my list of deciding. things, like I don't have time to do all the things. Yeah. So I have to figure delegate. out where to, where to delegate yeah. and pare it down. But I am making the uh, tiles for the bar top, which is sort of insane. Um, <laughs> how I get myself into these things is I don't plan them out ahead of time. I think mm. I can do that and I start doing yeah. it. And then I think, oh, Boy, how am I going to do this? Yeah, and then I figure it out. Hand painted every wedding invitation that we sent out. (laughs) She's an amazing artist. Oh my goodness! And she painted these cherry blossoms. But after you know, she's on her eighth, and she's got sixty more to go. I'm like, really, you're going to do this? She's like, what have I got myself into? (laughs) Yeah, I already started. Michelle was doing the tiles. She said the same thing. She's like, I'm ten percent done. She has this box of tiles. I'm like. Have you done? <laughs> she picked like uh, I don't know what they're one he- in, one inch hexagon, two inch, two inch, hexagons. two inch hexagons, which is not a problem. The problem is that For we a have a seat bar. horseshoe shaped bar, right? So the problem so you have is to fit them into that, fitting them around the edge. It's going to be beautiful, which I figured out. It's going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. um, so if, what makes you a professional professional in all of this? How do you know all this stuff? Um, well, I went to college, got a degree in uh, photography and ceramics, and um, my name Vander Walker is actually my um, paternal grandmother's maiden name. Um, so her side of the family, super artistic. Her father um, built his own house in the style of Frank Lloyd Wright outside of Chicago. Wow. And um, was an interior designer, painter. Um, so I'm making these tiki mugs that have um, vegetables on them instead of miscellaneous Polynesian faces. And those designs actually came straight from a brochure of stencils that my great grandfather made. Oh, cool. um, so I'm finding ways to use things from my heritage to yeah. stick in the bar. They fit in. Love that. Um, so I took my grandmother's. Which is a Danish name, I think. Right. Oh, oh yeah. French, yeah. yeah, I blew it. My <laughs> I picked the wrong. <laughs> I picked the wrong side of her family. My uh, other grandmother is French. Yeah. So. Um, Thanks for clarifying. Her oh, mom. My pleasure. Her mom was going to call me out if we didn't yeah. fix that at some point. <laughs> so um, I grew up with my grandmother doing art projects. She was an artist. She was a printmaker. Um, she would always just figure out how to use things in everyday life. She was a problem solver. So a lot of the things that she used in her printmaking were um, detritus from everyday life, like netting from the clementine bags or uh, the plastic rings from a six-pack. Um, so that's where I got a lot of my um, creative abilities. Um, and my, I guess, penchant for just starting things and, and going for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what's the, you say you want people to feel like they're in some place else. Where do you want them to feel like when they go walk in? Well, some Tahiti? place. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we want not. it to be Durham. We want it to be Durham. Yeah. But I want you to feel like you're walking into Carborough. <laughs> <laughs> no, That's no. very sp- yeah. A lot of patchouli. Don't no. bother getting on the 15. Just yeah. come to <laughs> just a very come to Chapel Hill Road. Specific whole Durham place. So um, we want to feel different than everywhere else. Um, only we only want to feel different because. You know, all spaces should be useful to people, right. not, not because we think anyone's doing like a like a poor job. It's just that you know, <laughs> if you're gonna make open something, you should contribute something new. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, so because it's a basement space, we're gonna be able to control the lighting completely. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're working on having really nice, cozy, um, low lit for the most part space. Um, our friends are carpenters, and they're building our booths for us and tables um, out of reclaimed wood from a barn um we're gonna have a little gallery space in the back that um we're hoping to have collaborate with some local artists on putting their work up and or doing uh site specific installations um back there so yeah just a really unique cozy pleasant place to be sounds amazing so you guys kind of answered this question but i want to hear you expand upon uh because coming up in durham you are going to ha- you're go- you already have Alley 26 there. You have Dram and Draft uh, having an iteration in Durham. Is that official? That's official. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then you guys are going to be opening up across the street from Alley 26. So and what, there's already Barber Gilles as well. And Barber Gilles. Yeah. So how do you guys the define Durham hotel, the Durham all of Hotel? That. Yeah, there's so many bars. Yeah. How do you guys define yourself in that space in Durham? And before you answer that, yeah, think about it for a moment because I need to place my uh, 
wine order at Triangle Wine Company, yes, guests of the show uh, could could also get a fantastic wine order uh, from Triangle Wine Company. They have three locations all around the Triangle in Southern Pines, Morrisville, and Cary. You can go to trianglewinecode.com and place all of your orders. The best part is uh, they will deliver to your house. What? You can buy wine and beer and even sodas and whatever else, and they will deliver it to your place. Uh, the guys over there are really cool. They're very friendly, and they're friendly with us, uh, so much so that you can put in NCFB as a promo code when you put said order to be l- delivered to your house and receive 10% off. Who knew? Isn't that cool? So uh, so go to trianglewineco.com, and we're back. So, Matt, you teed it up. But yeah. We want to know. Yeah, so how do you set yourself apart from the rest of the Durham cocktail scene? Uh, I believe that living in Durham, going to all these cocktail bars, um, I think everyone does like a unique, good job that caters to um, like a missing kind of um, piece of, of the Durham kind of bar scene. I think it's great that somewhere like Dram and Draft with such a whiskey focus is going to open. I think Alley 26 didn't has done and does an excellent job of, of teaching people about cocktails, making awesome, super balanced drinks um, that, that people love in a space that's comfortable. I think Barber Gilles is really fun, beautiful space. Drinks are great. It's near Deepak. Um, I think they've, they've, they've got it down pat. So when we look to do something, we, you know, we said, should we make a cocktail bar that focuses on stirred brown spirits or, or, or and like classic drinks, or should we try and try and do something like that contributes um and and i think we saw our niche because michelle has been in durham uh for a long time um has a lot of friends who who grow things who are makers in durham and i i think that's kind of where where we saw uh you know our our talents and you know our resources being so that's that's where we wanted to kind of take take our 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 ideas i think um (laughs) i think bartenders that have worked for me would probably call my palate a little bit um bombastic or maybe a couple of them call it sweet but i i i prefer drinks and i make drinks that are fun uh lively um heavy on flavor they're they're not i'm not the guy probably to make you like the greatest brown and stirred and bitter or lean drink um there will be some of those but they i promise will be invented by another bartender (laughs) there and probably not me so i think i just have a unique kind of sense of, of what I like to drink and make and it's and it's different than, than other people in town. Um, I also think that we were looking to make a space, you know, as Durham evolves, it's a it's a young, even though it's a super vibrant food scene, where uh, a lot of a lot of the spaces um, have been geared towards a, a younger clientele, younger being t- mid twenties that are that are um, loud and open and boisterous and really, really fun. Um, and we want to make a place that is equally fun, but maybe um, somewhere that we you know aim for for someone a little bit older, somewhere that you can go and have like a private conversation, be with your friends, be part what was it part of the bar, but not in the bar, but not of the bar if you don't want to be. Um, we're having we have yeah. a couple big booths that are that are situated. And, and fairly closed off on three sides just so you can, you know, have that sort of semi-private experience where, you know, if you're going to celebrate with eight people, you might not want to, you might not be the kind of crowd that celebrates with the other 80 people in the bar, a birthday or or a job promotion or an anniversary. I guess anniversaries with eight people is kind of weird, but <laughs> <laughs> but that's how I would do it. Um, they so, do those in, in Utah. It's pretty <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if they're, if they're in town for a conference or something. But anyway, we want to have this space that, that also, you know, lends itself to to where Durham is going. You know, people that have been there for ten years and see it as a, as a place to to live and 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 raise a family uh, that you know want to go out, but maybe um, maybe want just something that hasn't been in Durham yet because because Durham is is growing and evolving and and filling. I still think has lots of room to fill all kinds of people's needs. Yeah, and I'll just add to that the people that might not live in the Triangle or live in North Carolina. Uh, as Shannon Healy, uh, who will be your neighbor and is a former guest of the show, said, you cannot turn your head in Durham, in Durham without look, seeing a crane building some residential buildings. I mean, it is exponentially growing, mm-hmm. and especially downtown Durham, to mm-hmm. the amount of residential places that will be upcoming there. So kind of smart place to get in and start your business. Yeah, yeah and, and really, you know, the food scene in Durham is – 
is a huge part of why Durham is what it is now. People moved downtown because there were things to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys are doing something truly different. and Hopefully. Uh, we still have to do it. Of so. the place. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. so how far away are you yeah. from getting this place open? We're, we're taping right now. Right. Uh, August Beginning 3rd. of August. Yeah. So where we're, are we at? Um, so I'm hoping by 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 the, the winter that we have an yeah. up and running cocktail bar and uh sunny's not going to throw you out of saint rock until then right no he won't throw me out okay good. i hope we've <laughs> talked about not throwing me out so fingers <laughs> crossed. everyone come to saint rock while you're while while i'm still there or after it's a great restaurant uh, saint rock is amazing. an awesome restaurant yeah, yeah that's and we didn't even mention that at the, at the top sean has been running the uh, the front of the house there from the beginning uh so even that you work you're you're currently working at saint rock uh, you have worked at 21C Hotel. That's where the two of you met. Mm-hmm. You're talking about. You also w- worked at Heron's at the Umstead. Mm-hmm. Sean Umstead. I know. No relation. No relation. No. Well, vague relation to the governor that the park is named after, and thus the things things are named after. Um, but he's <laughs> oh. like he's like a great great uncle, wrong side of the family. But, but yeah. By the way, I know it was a couple of years ago since you've been there, but I'm sure it, you were a part of that. Um, just received five stars from the News and Observer. Uh, a glowing recommendation. If yeah. you read that oh. recommend, if you read that uh, review, you want to go eat there. Yeah, it's very impressive. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Well, uh, well, thank you for being on the show. This was awesome. Oh, we sure. really look forward to the opening of Kingfisher, which is a bird, right? Isn't that what a yes. Kingfisher is? Oh yeah. Michelle, you want to talk about what the name came from for one second? Well, Sean came <laughs> up with the name, um, but yes, it is a bird. It's a sort of unique bird in a way. It does exist all over the world, but it's also a local bird that you can find along the rivers in North Carolina, um, the belted kingfisher in particular. Um, it's a fishing bird, so it perches above the river and dives into the water to get fish. It also is unique in that it burrows and has its nest underground, hmm. which I we had the name before we had a basement bar, but I thought it was quite appropriate. Fitting. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So, but why why are you so into kingfishers? Oh, that's a it. Um, it's a long and winding story that starts with some Greek mythology that I kind of looped into my own life. But it really comes down to the, the kingfisher. To me, is a local, unique bird. Um, you see it and you say, "Wow, that thing lives on the Eno River." Like it looks like it would be just as just as uh, happy, you know. In Greece or, or or on the Amazon or something, it's got this beautiful yeah. beak. It's it's sort of colorful. It's it's kind of interesting and small and compact. So we want a local unique bar, and this is a local unique bird, and it kind of uh, does a good job of representing uh, uh, what what our kind of ethos is. Um, yeah. I love that. Thanks. Yeah. Well, you guys are the ultimate DIYers when it comes to bar. <laughs> so I am personally looking forward to Kingfisher. Uh, we didn't even get into it, but there'll be some nice wine, and there'll be some, um, and there'll be some food there as well. Yeah, we'll so, have a full kitchen. Yeah, so we're all looking forward to going there. But yeah, uh, listen, you guys, the the uh, pedigree is there. We didn't get much into your history, but obviously the creative drive from Michelle and your creation with the cocktails and plus your both of yours experience in the industry is very evident, and uh, I think it will carry through in Kingfisher. So until then, go see Sean at St. Rock and visit him there. Buy Vander Walker Ceramics. Where can you get that? VanderWalkerDesign.com. VanderWalkerDesign.com. Uh, get those products. Go to St. Rock. Then go to Kingfisher. You will eat and drink very early. For listening to the NC F&B Podcast. And if you've stuck with us this long, review us on iTunes and remember, five stars are encouraged. <laughs>